Chapter 15. One afternoon they were climbing the glossy limbed chital tree at the bottom of the garden, Mademoiselle Lorivier and little Lucette, screened by a caprice of the coppice but just within earshot, were playing grace hoops. One glimpsed, now and then, above or through foliage, the skimming hoop, passing from one unseen sending stick to another. The first cicada of the season kept trying out its instrument. A silver and sable sky bab squirrel sat sampling a cone on the back of a bench. Van in a blue gym suit, having worked his way up to a fork just under his agile playmate, who naturally was better acquainted with the tree's intricate map, but no, not being able to see her face, betokened mute communication by taking her ankle between finger and thumb, as she would have a closed butterfly. Her bare foot slipped and the two panting youngsters tangled ignominiously among the branches in a shower of droops and leaves clutching at each other. And the next moment, as they regained a semblance of balance, his expressionless face and cropped head were between her legs and a last fruit fell with a thud, the dropped dot of an inverted exclamation point. She was wearing his wristwatch in a cotton frock. Remember? Yes, of course I remember. You kissed me here on the inside, and you started to strangle me with those devilish knees of yours. I was seeking some sort of support. That might have been true, but according to a later, considerably later, version, they were still in the tree and still glowing when Van removed a silk thread of larva web from his lip and remarked that such negligence of attire was a form of hysteria. What does that mean? Well, answered Ardor, straddling her favorite limb, as we all know by now, Mademoiselle Le Rivier, the diamants has nothing against a hysterical little girl's not wearing pantalets during La Ardor de la Canicule. I refuse to share the ardor of your little canicule with an apple tree. It is really the tree of knowledge this specimen was imported last summer wrapped up in brocade from the Eden National Park, where Dr. Krolik's son is a ranger and breeder. Let him range and breed by all means, said Van. Her natural history had long begun to get on his nerves. But I swear no apple trees grow in a rock. Right, but that's not a true apple tree. Right and wrong, commented Ardor, again much later. We did discuss the matter, but you could not have permitted yourself such vulgar repartees then. At a time when the chastest of chances allowed you to snatch, as they say, a first shy kiss. Oh, for shame, and besides, there was no national park in Iraq 80 years ago. True, said Van, and no caterpillars bred on that tree in our orchard. True, my lovely and larveless. Natural history was past history by that time. Both kept diaries soon after that foretaste of knowledge, an amusing thing happened. She was on her way to Krolik's house with a box full of hatched and chlor chloroformed butterflies and had just passed through the orchard when she suddenly stopped and swore short. At the same moment, Van, who had set out in the opposite direction for a bit of shooting practice in a nearby pavilion, where there was a bowling alley and other recreational facilities once much used by other beans, also came to an abrupt standstill. Then, by a nice coincidence, both went tearing back to the house to hide their diaries, which both thought they had left lying open in their respective rooms. Ardor, who feared the curiosity of Lucette and Blanche, the governess presented no threat, being pathologically unobservant, found out she was wrong. She had put away the album with its latest entry. Van, who knew that Ardor was a little snoopy, discovered Blanche in his room, feigning to make, feigning to make the maid bed, with the unlocked diary lying on the stool beside it. 
He slapped her lightly on the behind and removed the chagrin-bound book to a safer place. Then Van and Ardor met in the passage and would have kissed at some earlier stage of the novel's evolution in the history of literature. It might have been a near little sequel to the Chital Tree incident. Instead, both resumed their separate ways, and Blanche, I suppose, went to weep in her bower. Chapter 16 Their first free and frantic caresses had been preceded by a brief period of strange craftiness of cringing stealth. The masked offender was Van, but her passive acceptance of the poor boy's behavior seemed tacitly to acknowledge its disreputable and even monstrous nature. A few weeks later, both were to regard that phase of his courtship with amused condescension. At the time, however, its implicit cowardice puzzled her and distressed him. Mainly because he was keenly conscious of her being puzzled. Although Van had never had the occasion to witness anything close to virginal revolt on the part of Ardor, not an easily frightened or over-fastidious little girl, je refold de tout ce qui ramp, he could rely on two or three dreadful dreams to imagine her in real or at least responsible life, recoiling with a wild look as she left his lust in the lurch to summon her governess or mother, or a gigantic footman not existing in the house but killable in the dream, punchable with sharp ringed knuckles, puncturable like a bladder of blood, after which he knew he would be expelled from Ardis. In Ardor's hand, I vehemently object to that not over fastidious. It is unfair, in fact, and fuzzy and fancy. Van's marginal note. Sorry, puss. That must stay. But even if he were to will himself to mock that image so as to blast it out of all consciousness, he could not feel proud of his conduct in those actual undercover dealings of his with ardor by doing what he did and the way he did it with that unpublished relish he seemed to himself to be either taking advantage of her innocence or else inducing her to conceal from him, the concealer, her awareness of what he concealed. After the first contact so light, so mute, between his soft lips and her softer skin had been established high up in that dappled tree with only that stray ardilla daintily eve daintily leaves dropping. Nothing seemed changed in one sense, all was lost in another. Such contacts evolve their own texture. A tactile sensation is a blind spot. We touch in silhouette. Henceforth, at certain moments of their otherwise indolent days and certain recurrent circumstances of controlled madness, a secret sign was erected, a veil drawn between him and her. Arda, they are now practically extinct at Artis. Van, who? Oh, I see not to be removed until he got rid of what the necessity of dissimulation kept degrading to the level of a wretched itch. Ach, Van. He could not say afterwards when discussing with her that rather pathetic nastiness whether he really feared that his Auvergne, as Blanche was to refer later in her bastard French to ardor, might react with an outburst of real or well-feigned resentment to a stark display of desire, or whether a glum, cunning approach was dictated to him by considerations of pity and decency toward a chaste child, whose charm was too compelling not to be tasted in secret and too sacred to be openly violated. But something went wrong, that much was clear, the vague commonplaces of vague modesty so dreadfully in vogue 80 years ago. The uns the unsufferable banalities of shy wooing buried in old romances as arch as Arcady. Those moods, those modes lurked no doubt behind the hush of his ambuscades and that of her toleration. No record has remained of the exact summer day when his wary and elaborate codlings began. But simultaneously with her sensing that at certain moments he stood indecently close behind her with his burning breath and gliding lips, she was aware that those silent exotic approximations must have started long ago in some indefinite and infinite past and could no longer be stopped by her without her acknowledging a tacit acceptance of their routine repetition in that past. <laughs> oh, 
On those relentlessly hot July afternoons, Ardor liked to sit on a cool piano stool of ivory wood at a white oilclothed table in the sunny music room. Her favorite botanical atlas opened before her and copy out in color on creamy paper some singular flower. She might choose, for instance, an insect-mimicking orchid, which she would proceed to enlarge with remarkable skill. Or else she combined one species with another, unrecorded but possible, introducing odd little changes and twists that seemed almost morbid in so young a girl so nakedly dressed. The long beam slanting in from the French window glowed in the faceted tumbler and the tinted water and on the tin of the paint box. And while she delicately painted an eye spot on the lobes of a lip, rapturous concentration caused the tip of her tongue to curl at the corner of her mouth. And as the sun looked on, the fantastic black, blue, brown haired child seemed in her turn to mimic the mirror of Venus Blossom. Her flimsy, loose frock happened to be so deeply cut out behind that whenever she concaved her back while moving her prominent scapulae to and fro and tilting her head, as with air poised brush she surveyed her damp achievement, or with the outside of her left wrist wiped a strand of hair off her temple, Van, who had drawn up to her seat as close as he dared, could see down her sleek insular as far as her cossacks and inhale the warmth of her entire body. His heart thumping, one miserable hand deep in his trouser pocket, where he kept a purse with half a dozen ten dollar gold pieces to disguise his state. He bent over her as she bent over her work. Very lightly, he let his parched lips travel down her warm hair and hot nape. It was the sweetest, the strongest, the most mysterious sensation that the boy had ever experienced. Nothing in his sordid venery of the past winter could duplicate that downy tenderness, that despair of desire. He would have lingered forever on the little middle knob of rounded delight on the back of her neck. Had she kept it inclined forever, and had the unfortunate fellow been able to endure much longer the ecstasy of its touch under his wax still mouth without rubbing against her with mad abandon. The vivid crimsoning of an exposed ear and the gradual torpor invading her paintbrush were the only signs, fearful signs, of her feeling the increased pressure of his caress. Silently, he would slink away to his room, lock the door, grasp a towel, uncover himself, and call forth the image he had just left behind, an image still as safe and bright as a handcuffed flame, carried into the dark only to be got rid of there with savage zeal after which, drained for a while with shaky loins and weak calves, Van would return to the purity of the sun-suffused room where a little girl, now glistening with sweat, was still painting her flower. The marvelous flower that simulated a bright moth that in turn simulated a scarab. If the relief, any relief, of a lad's ardor had been Van's sole concern, if, in other words, no love had been involved, our young friend might have put up for one casual summer with the nastiness and ambiguity of his behavior. But since Van loved ardor, that complicated release could not be an end in itself, or rather it was only a dead end because unshared, because horribly hidden, because not liable to melt into any, any subsequent phase of incomparably greater rapture which, like a misty summit beyond the fierce mountains pass promised to be the true pinnacle of his perilous relationship with ardor during that midsummer week or fortnight notwithstanding those daily butterfly kisses on that hair on that neck van felt even farther removed from her than he had been on the eve of the day when his mouth had accidentally come into contact with an inch of her skin hardly perceived by him sensually in the maze of the chital tree But nature is motion and growth. One afternoon he came up behind her in the music room more noiselessly than ever before because he happened to be barefooted and turning her head, little Arter shut her eyes and pressed her lips to his in a fresh rose kiss that entranced and baffled Van. Now run along, she said. Quick, quick, I'm busy. And as he lagged like an idiot, she anointed his flushed forehead with her paintbrush in the semblance of an ancient Estodian sign of the cross. I have to finish this, she added pointing with her violet purple-soaked thin brush at a blend of Ophris scolopax and Ophris vinae. And in a minute we must dress up because Marina wants Kim to take our picture, holding hands and grinning. Grinning and then turning back to her hideous flower.